Okay, so let's get started. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to our seventh se session in this series. And what an amazing run it's been, starting in April. Um, and I hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have. Whole set of really interesting books, most of which I hadn't read before, uh, a handful of which I had never heard about before. So I hope you've had a good experience if you managed to read some of them. And if you haven't read them and Mark's lectures have uh, made you want to read them. Anyway, I'm going to turn this over to him because we've got a lot to cover. And the only thing I want to mention, as I've mentioned at the beginning of this, is that next week, Thursday, it's the final session. And we are hoping to have Mark in person in the library to give the lecture from the Brubeck Room. We will still broadcast it by Zoom for those of you who can't uh, come to the library for whatever reason. But if we've got enough interest from folks, we'd like to have Mark here and we'll have a little short reception afterwards where we can all chat and chat with him. So I'm going to send you all an email uh, right after this program. And if you can just let me know as soon as you can, just yes, no, whether you would uh, be coming next Thursday so we can decide, A, if there's enough interest and if there is, how much wine and snacks do, uh, do I need to buy? So you'll, you'll all get that uh, shortly after the program tonight. Uh, so with that, I'm turning it over to Mark for tonight's session. Thank you, Michael. And thanks, as always, for um, inviting me in the partnership. Uh, I'll tell those of you who are listening now that in the 20 minutes or so before we began this, Michael and I brainstorm on what I might do uh, in the fall and uh, I have good relationship with all my librarians and great admiration and affection for them. But I'll say about Michael, and not just because he's listening, um, he's the rare librarian who has um, really good opinions um, and informed opinions about things that might work. And uh, both quartets of sessions that we're thinking of uh, had their themes and topics suggested just now by Michael, which I've uh, agreed to. So thanks for that. So I want to begin by saying in my long career now, um, 40 years or so as a teacher, I am very sensitive that there are certain works of literary art that everyone, the teacher especially, has to be respectful of, not to make too academic. I have taught Holocaust novels to uh, students who are the descendants of Holocaust survivors or Holocaust victims. I'm aware of that. I have taught uh, African-American novels to students who have shared with me that there's slavery in their family background. And uh, you want to be very respectful of not making it seem as if uh, we, that is the group of us here assembled tonight or any class I've taught, and certainly not me as a person more or less running the show, is turning it into some abstract um, literary uh, study. The heart of literature is that it is the enactment of experience in language and form. And if you remember that, that very concise definition, that what literature conveys, uh, not ideas necessarily, literature can have ideas, but that's not why we read literature alone. It's to make you experience what happened either in the past or currently or in some imagined realm. So I'm very respectful that most of you, if you read these two little pieces that together have formed a novel since 1983, uh, I expect that most of you get it without my help. Uh, but here I am. And I do want to suggest some things that you might not have noticed uh, since I do this for a living and uh, most of you do not. So one way to get at the book is uh, clearly the two parts are very different, related, but very different. Uh, the first short piece on the shawl is lyrical, even though the subject matter is traumatic, uh, very impressionistic. It focuses that one of the first words of the section is cold and on hunger, eating and drinking, including the eating of human beings, uh, cannibalism, um, the drinking of uh, the uh, shawl, 
uh, very much an emphasis on sense of smell, which people think of as the most visceral of all the senses. It opens with Stella Cold. And you'll remember that when Magna, I'm sorry, when Rosa confronts Stella about why she took the shawl from the baby Magda, she says simply, I was cold. I was cold. Uh, and in the magnificent Drowned and the Saved by Primo Levi, he says that one of the most dehumanizing things about the camps was that it made you compete with other prisoners, other inmates, for scarce resources, and it made you feel you were allying yourself with the torturers. And he gave examples that when you saw someone who was weak starting to fail, that is someone who was drowning in his metaphor, uh, you wanted not to associate with them so that you wouldn't be called into taking care of them by a guard, but you wanted to keep an eye on them because if they stopped walking, you were gonna take their shoes. And if they died, you were going to take their clothes. And that it's an unfortunate fact of the dehumanization of the camps that you become one of the saved by staying away from the drowned and therefore collaborating in their drowning. That's what poor Stella, teenage Stella, effectively does when she takes the shawl, uh, unintentionally leading to Magda's death. Magna was not long for this world, as Rosa says, Magda. Uh, and uh, her explanation is the very human, I was cold. So the elemental sense of the language and the climate, if you will, of the first section is also in the language of how often the word shawl gets invoked. Um, 31 times uh, in the few pages of the first story, uh, how there's repetition. Uh, they were in page five in this edition. They were in a place without pity. All pity was annihilated in Rosa. She looked at Stella's bones without pity. Uh, that's, a, that's a single sentence. Those three pities all within a single sentence. Um, if this were a high school class, a teacher would correct that paper, uh, avoid needless repetition. It's done to suggest the sort of catatonia of the prose that's associated with poor Rose's state of mind. It also suggests that pity is such an important word and value that there's no need to try to find a synonym. Pity is pity is pity. And later on, when the horrible scene of the Nazi soldier uh, taking Magda up because Rosa had a terrible choice. Um, Magda is out in the arena, that is in the, the, the camp's yard, and the shawl is somewhere inside. If she runs for Magda, she's not sure uh, Magda will allow her to pick her up and silence her. Also, she suspects she won't be able to quiet her without the shawl. If she runs and tie, inside to get the shawl, as she does, uh, she has the risk that Magda will uh, call attention to herself. And Magda, in that moment, speaks her first syllable ever, M-A-A-A, -A -A, ma, we'll talk about that in a moment. So when the scene is of the Nazi soldier picking her up, there's a reference to Magda was moving more and more into the smoky distance. And remember, the last line of the whole work, the last line of Rosa, is Magda was away that is partly exercise, partly giving Rosa some space to let um, uh, uh, Persky up. Uh, it says, uh, smoky distance, above the shoulder, a helmet glinted. The light tapped the helmet and sparkled into a goblet. Below the helmet, a block, black body like a domino and a pair of black boots hurled themselves in the direction of the electrified fence. So as with pity, 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 the black helmet, the helmet is repeated uh, because um, it's all you need to know about what's happening. The soldier has no identity. He has no individuality. He's a Nazi soldier. And unlike uh, the image of pity being repeated, 
using the helmet to represent not only the entire soldier, but the whole notion of Nazi torture, is a figure of speech that's called synecdoche, S-Y-N-E-C-D-O-C-H-E. If you're going to a cocktail party this weekend, try to drop it into conversation. S-Y-N-E-C-D-O-C-H-E, synecdoche, which is the figure of speech that um, substitutes a part for the whole. All hands on deck doesn't just mean hands. It means the people who work the ship. I have 40 head of cattle. Will sound very strange to somebody who doesn't know that hand head is a shorthand. Um, the soldier gets reduced to the helmet. Uh, that spareness is part of the way this first section works. Uh, that's one of the things that carries the loss of humanity and adornment and rhetoric. It's also true that there's the extraordinary symbolism of the shawl, which on the one hand is a kind of extension of the womb. It's a way of keeping um, uh, Magda enclosed outside of Rose's body. We're told on page six that in some ways it's Magda's own ba baby, so the baby's baby. And of course, many people, I'm sure, without my pointing it out, associated with the Jewish prayer shawl, especially since there's a reference to the smell of cinnamon and almonds, which are often associated with the Shabbat service, or at least ritual in a family, uh, the Jewish prayer shawl, uh, a, a garment of protection that also has a religious connotation. And in this work, also protection in the sense of uh, disguising that a child even exists. Another thing about the elemental nature of the prose of the first section, and remember the second section is much more uh, realistic. Uh, we're in Miami at some time in the 1970s, the dialogue. There's a surreal quality to some aspects of it, especially when she is caught in the private beach that's protected by barbed wire, or she has the visions of being haunted by a magna that she doesn't, who she doesn't believe is dead, but it's more realistic by far than the first story. Uh, another aspect of um, the way elemental language works um, in, in the story is Freud did an essay on the antithetical use of primal words, that in a lot of cultures, uh, a single word is used, say, for hello and goodbye, like aloha. Or the word cleave can mean to separate, like a meat cleaver divides pork chops. But you can also cleave to your mother and cling to her. Um, and mosey used to mean hurry up, and now it also means slow down and so on. Um, it's the nature of elemental languages that they often have a word that means the opposition some languages, I know that this is true in Lebanese culture, describe, for example, the relationship between a niece and an aunt with the same word. The niece calls her aunt the same word that the aunt calls the niece. That is, they're not talking about the person, they're talking about the relationship. Uh, and there's a lot of this sense of language being very elemental uh, in the novel. So on page five, in the first part of the story, in the shawl, we're told that Rosa was ravenous, but also not a kind of paradox. Um, on page 29, when um, Rosa is in the hotel lobby and people are opening mail and she's gonna pick up her mail, we're told it was real and it was not real. Uh, that sentence would be different if it said it was real and not real, but it was real and it was not real, points to the fact that even in her after concentration camp life, Rosa is still dealing with the essential issue in this book, which is the unreality of reality. The impossibility of making sense of the horror of the Holocaust. And of course, everyone understands, I don't mean denying its historical fact, fact factness, 
I mean that the mind cannot get its head around that this could have happened publicly in a civilized Europe not that long ago, uh, and much of the world knew about it. And it was done in a way like American slavery uh, that was institutionalized and not just allowed, but blessed. Um, they thought it was a good thing for societies. The plantation owners thought they were doing good Christian work by making uh, profit from people who were less than human. So the unreality of reality is very much an aspect uh, of this book. Um, it also points to how different people see things very differently, even though they're the same thing. So um, when she can't get out of the private beach that she's wanted into, she is shocked to be locked behind barbed wire, behind barbed wire on a beach in Miami. And she says to the man in the lobby, in America, it's no place for barbed wire on top of fences. And there's one of the few places in the novel where it refers to America by name. The bulk of this uh, joint novel is in America, in Miami, in Florida. But here, America has no place for barbed wire on the top of fences, but it's put up to keep out, he says, the riffraff. That is the undesirables, uh, a separation between those who can and those who can't. And it's very chilling to recognize that although she has uh, a dramatic reaction because of her past, which we completely understand, we can all think, what is barbed wire doing on a fence in a resort beach? Well, it's there to keep people from climbing in. Uh, and my point is, this is a world where barbed wire uh, can be in the context of a concentration camp in the 40s or in the context of a posh resort in the 1970s. Barbed wire came into American culture when the men who were ranchers were trying to keep their ranches free of the cowboys who were bringing cattle on cattle drives north and south and running over the farms and ranches on the way from Texas to Montana. And they found a cheap way to put up wire that would um, hurt the drive, uh, the cattle drive, if they came, was not expensive, didn't require you to build holes in the ground and posts. Uh, and the cattle drivers, the cowboys, routinely traveled with wire cutters to remove the barbed wire. It, it was meant as a way to allow people to homestead. Like blue jeans, it's very much a technology that is part of the history of America. Of course, in the concentration camp, it's used to rustle people uh, and daunting. Uh, when you think about the fact that a single thing can mean more than one thing, depending on the context, I'm always reminded of the movie version of E.L. Doctorow's excellent novel, Ragtime. The scene I'm about to describe is in the novel, but the, li the, the line that I'm going to quote is not. The young brother, who's just called the young brother, the white man who uh, lives in uh, Westchester and whose family has a black woman working for them who turns out to be connected uh, to Cole House Walker, the man who has taken over uh, the Morgan Library to hold it ransom because he's been severely abused and disrespected by a racist white fire chief. Um, he offers his services to the masked black men who are holding the Morgan Library hostage until uh, the fire chief apologizes and restores Cole House Walk Walker's car. Uh, too nice a car for an uppity, you know what? Uh, and when the black, the white brother goes uh, with a mask over his head and says, "I'm here. I'm here to offer my services," they laugh at him because what is he going to do for them? And he says, "You know, my family business is making fireworks." And they laugh even more. In the movie, one of the black men is played by a very young, early in his career, Samuel L. Jackson. They're like, fireworks, what do we need with fireworks? Because they're thinking, uh, mom and the Wilton Green and apple pie and the 4th of July. And he says, you know, explosives. 
And as soon as he changes the context, it's the same stuff, right? It's stuff that explodes, whether it's a firecracker or uh, an M80, as I remember we called them as kids, or a stick of dynamite. It's the same stuff. But if you call it fireworks, it's one thing. If you call it explosives, it's another. Are you a freedom fighter or are you a terrorist? And one of the things the book does is say, if your experience has been imbued, distorted, tainted by being kept captive, by having your daughter flung into an electric fence in front of your eyes, if Stella, your niece, becomes someone you think is competing for the protein value of your daughter, um, you can't go back to just thinking of Stella as a sweet girl even though she's sending money to support her aunt. You can't see barbed wire on a resort and see it the way that somebody in the resort would see it. And the novel does a fantastic job of reminding us it's not what, but in what context. Not what, but in what context. So Persky is invited up to Rose's room for tea. And he says, because he's a charmer, there's some Yiddish Jewish wit in him. He's a little bit of a Mel Brooks figure, I think. And it's hard not to read his dialogue without hearing the uh, New York City Yiddish inflection in your head. Doesn't have to be New York City, but that's my background. Uh, he tells her the room is cozy. And she replies with one word, which is cramped. So his cozy as her cramped. Now, he's not only trying to be ingratiating because he's a flirt, he's also someone who we sense from the few pages we're with him, really sees things in their best light, and she's not. One of the things he tells her in his wisdom is she needs to try to be a regular person again. And the issue is, what does it mean to be a regular person when your reality is unreal. So another kind of reversal is we learn from Rosa's own conversation with us that she is lying and deceiving Stella to tell Stella that Magna is dead because it will soothe her dementia. It will calm uh, Stella down when in fact we know the person who is um, denying reality is Rosa. And it's not that she's deceiving, uh, it's that she believes in her uh, grief, uh, in her being inconsolable, that Magda is alive. Uh, she writes to her niece in English, she writes to her uh, daughter, her, her, uh, her, yes, her daughter in Polish. So the most remarkable way in which language works uh, in doubleness, in the idea that one word can mean more than one thing, is when um, uh, Magda says her first word, which is ma, uh, and if you'll follow with me, if you have the book with you, otherwise you'll know that I'm not making this up. It's, um, you know, I had a piece of paper in here and I took it out to make a note. So you'll excuse me for just a second where I, where I catch up here. Um, her first syllable is spoken at the top of page eight, spilling a long, viscous rope of clamor, clamor. And she yells out, Ma, M A A A A. And then again, even longer. And then it turns out that when she's thrown into the fences, the sound that the fence makes is the same sound. Uh, it's the sound of ma uh, near the bottom of page nine after the helmet takes her off. The electric voices about eight lines up the bottom of page nine began to chatter wildly. Ma, 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 they all hum together how far Magda was from Rosa now. Again, that's the image of the last line of this short story, Magda being away. So I'm facing pages in my text. The first syllable that Magda speaks because she doesn't have her mouth filled with a shawl, uh, 
doesn't have her mouth filled with her mother's breast is ma, which is the syllable of mama, but it's also the syllable of magna. And it turns out it's the syllable that the electronic fences make. This is a world in which there's no easy distinction between ma being mother, ma being me, myself, and ma being death. Uh, remarkably well done. You can imagine the hum of electric fence being that ma, that kind of buzz. Um, one of the things of keeping Magda in the shawl, of not letting her walk, uh, of not being able, not her fault, to not the mother's fault, to sufficiently nourish her, is that she is infantilized. Um, she's not speaking. We're told that she's mute. We're told that her legs are spindles. And at 15 months, she could be walking. And one of the things that um, impairs her is the deficiency caused by the um, overprotectiveness of the mother completely understandable. None of this is meant as a criticism. But this is a world where, our world, where fireworks can be explosives, where a room might be cozy or cramped, where a sound might be a call to a mother or a call to name yourself or the sound of death. That's a remarkably well done feature of these remarkable two stories. I'm going to pause there since we're near the bottom of the hour and we have another story to talk about and ask Michael if he has questions or comments. As always, with the stories in this second quartet of novels at the end of this uh, eight-part series, I'm very eager to hear what you have to say on the level of your responses. Okay, folks, as uh, we've done, use the Q&A to... Uh, give us a question or a comment, a uh, reaction to either the two or particularly focus more on on uh, the first one, the shawl. I would only say while we're, while we're waiting, uh, Mark, that uh, the, what what I just realized in your comments about how much how much uh, was packed into a very compact space is is what makes it even more impressive in other words the 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 word or the sound ma combining to mean three different things at one time you know there are ways that those things sometimes get elaborated in a long novel but to compress it into something this short is right. even more and, impressive and before, stylistically well before we turn to people who have their hands up i'll say as a footnote to what you just said michael when i say a novel is lyrical I don't mean like a song. Uh, I certainly don't mean that there's anything song-like about this novel. I mean intensely poetical in the sense that the point of lyrics are because they have music, they don't have to say as much because the music does part of the work. And what Michael just said about the concentration of meaning in a single syllable or the concentration of all that's meant by barbed wire in a concentration camp alongside barbed wire uh, in a resort hotel is what poetry does. It says a lot economically. It says a lot without saying a lot. Okay. Yeah, and actually what uh, what came into my mind when you were just talking about that, that word slash sound ma and the compression of meaning into a very economical, tiny, efficient, spot was I you know I've been reading reading a bit about T.S. Eliot lately is that in the in the wasteland in the last part where it says what did the thunder say and the thunder said da right Michael I'm going to interrupt you because we're two men talking in a series about women novelists and there must be women who have something to say tonight I've got a comment okay good I have very mixed feelings about stories about the Holocaust Ozick did too it seems she hesitated to publish these stories for a while after she wrote them. She said, quote, I worry very much that this subject is corrupted by fiction and that fiction in general corrupts history, unquote. I am inclined to agree with her, but I'm torn because I think the stories are beautifully written and very moving. Yeah. Can, can, ooh, can you identify the first name of that person? Patricia. 
Thank you, Patricia. So I'm not unsympathetic to that, even though ultimately, obviously, here I am. Um, the downside of not doing it is that many people don't read history. And you write a single novel, even a short one, uh, that is moving and well-reviewed, and you will have millions more people learning about something than if they read it in a history book, because people won't read the history book. And I do think that that worry, which I understand completely, but don't ultimately agree with, is that you have we have to have more trust in fiction. Fiction not just making something up, it is enacting the experience of a mother at her wit's end with a baby who is almost certainly the product of a rape by one of the Nazi soldiers. How did she get pregnant in a concentration camp? She talks about worrying about Magda's Aryan side. She thinks there's some part of Magna that is other. Uh, and when you add that uh, to the complexity of her being a mother with a hidden child, if that's even possible in such an environment, and also having to compete with Stella as someone not just to care about, but to protect your daughter from, because her worry, maybe not completely irrational, is that one child will eat the other. You have to say, um, isn't that a better service to mankind to have people understand what can happen than trying to direct them to the facts? Um, Again, I think it was Primo Levi got a fan letter from a high school student, a woman, a girl, who sent him, looking for approbation, a long report she wrote on the social psychology of the German state. Uh, I believe she was a German student, but I can't swear to that. But she might have been an Italian student. In any event, her point was she wanted to say I was so moved by whichever one of his novels she read novels about the Holocaust. I want to show you this really, uh, yeah, it's, it's, she was German, really impressive uh, sort of nonfiction work. And he wrote back to her uh, to scold her gently to say, this kind of hyperbolic, ultra-rational, ultra-logistical study of the problem is what led to the Nazi state. Uh, better a bo poorly written novel than this breathtakingly rational, bloodless analysis, this sort of mega white paper. Um, and that always impressed me. Got another one from Susan. Having been robbed of her life and her child, the most enormous imaginable loss, Rosa fixated on a very small item but part of her self-respect as stolen by a well-meaning man. Theft became her obsession. Yes. So, um, again, very apt, Susan. Um, so it turned out he didn't take her panties, although you can understand why, given his uh, forwardness with her, she might think so. Uh, obviously, it's an article of women's clothing, like her shawl. Obviously, it's associated with her private parts and might be the kind of thing. We know that there are uh, such people who collect um, and, and keep panties. Um, it's a kind of violation that she worries about because she is forced to do a private thing, wash her clothes in a public space. It's a very nice touch about the kind of concessions that many of us make without thinking. Uh, I wash my clothes for many years as a graduate student in a laundromat. I wish I had a washer dryer in my apartment, but we weren't permitted. Um, I didn't think of myself as particularly disadvantaged, but then I don't have her history. So that it's an article of clothing and that sense of being violated, even as you see that she's starting to warm up to him. And the last action, visiting her right now, but maybe it's a sign that there will be more Persky and less Magda in her life, 
even if it's only a social dimension, it, it gives a kind of hope. Also, when we find out that she has just recently, in the last year, destroyed her shop with all its odds and ends, she says that she didn't like the kind of people who came there. And Persky understandably thinks she means that on some racial level, uh, because they were not Jews or not white. And what she says is she couldn't talk to them because her clientele were not her people, not in the sense of fellow Jews, but people who understood what she'd been through. Now, had they met in a different context uh, at a synagogue or a community center social, she may have found people whose cultural, demographic, racial, oppressive trauma approached her own, and she might have found common ground. But their clients, and she runs a store, and so in an act of violence, uh, with an ax and a piece of steel, she destroys it. And again, uh, understandable. Um, we actually have a follow-up comment from Susan okay. about the about the store. Uh, the rage that must have formed in Rosa finally found an outlet when she smashed her store as no substitute for what her life should have been, and incidentally served to deprive Stella of the trinkets she liked and embarrassing her by having her having such a crazy relative. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure many people in this room, I don't see you, uh, but I imagine you as of a certain age. I imagine you all very good looking and well appointed. So don't take that personally. Uh, but many of you, I'm sure, know the excellent and painful movie um, uh, starring Rod Steiger, The Pawn Broker. Uh, where he plays a Jewish man living a life of quiet desperation, desperation having survived uh, the Holocaust. And this came out in the 60s, so much closer to the Holocaust as a um, thing of people's living memory. A uh, magnificent performance um, and the same kind of dynamic of, of having a shop that is kind of the dregs of possessions loaded with artifacts, but a kind of déclassé shop. Um, he was passed over for Academy Award, and the following year, I believe it was, he won the Academy Award for um, In the Heat of the Night. He was very good, but uh, commenters believe they gave him the Academy Award for the latter movie because he earned it in the earlier movie. But a very similar dynamic of someone living not in communication with his clientele, uh, among things that are the artifacts of lives that he has nothing to do with in a kind of museum of leftovers. Yeah. So we've got one more. Uh, Ozick's poetic use. This is from Janet. Ozick's poetic use of the shawl in all its meanings lives forever. The shawl is every baby's using a stuffed animal or a great grandma's pillowcase to cuddle with for protection and peace. Yeah. And, you know, you think of, you know, one word for that kind of object is a talisman. Uh, a more negative word has become negative is a fetish, although originally fetish wasn't a negative thing. You think about how many people, children, adults, people from all cultures uh, and nations um, invest physical things with a spiritual or philosophical, religious, familial uh, dimension. Um, of things. I now have uh, three grandchildren. The nearly four-year-old has lots of, she calls them lovies, uh, animals and other representations that go into bed with her. Uh, the two boys are only four and six months old, but believe me, they have favorite toys they want to suck on while they're teething, uh, and they'll suck on this one, but not that one. Um, I want to say about the second story, and again, uh, I, I am not slighting the story, but I think we we all get it, what's happening in this um, dimension where the researcher wants to make her uh, object of study, where she's having the complicated, flirtatious and resistance relationship uh, with Persky. Um, she's writing multiple letters, both to Magda and to Stella and to Dr. Tree. And then she remembers um, the Warsaw Ghetto, the infamous Warsaw Ghetto. This is a woman who is very proud 
that her family were Poles. Uh, one of the terrible tragedies, travesties of 19th and 20th century history is the way the Poles became um, first uh, ridiculed and then vilified throughout Europe and the world. The Polish jokes that existed when I was a little kid in the, in the 50s and 60s and knew nothing about the history of this was an outcropping of both the Nazi propaganda machine and the Roman Catholic Church, um, which participated in the denigration, uh, even though some of those Poles were Catholics. Um, she's very proud of her Polish, of her father, uh, that she read uh, to him, who was a Polish poet, that she is more belonging to Warsaw than some of the other people. And then there's a remarkable passage on pages 68 to 69 that I'm going to read in its entirety because it's one of the best parts of the book. She's writing this to Magda. It's in the slightly smaller font of her letter to Magda, uh, which begins uh, on page 66, my gold, my wealth, my treasure, and so on, uh, and ends with the word lettuce on page 69. Well, the long paragraph that runs from 68 to 69 begins this way. The most astounding thing was that the most ordinary streetcar bumping along on the most ordinary trolley tracks and carrying the most ordinary citizens going from one section of Warsaw to another ran straight into the place of our misery. Every day and several times a day, we had these witnesses. Every day they saw us, women with shopping sacks. And once I noticed a head of lettuce sticking out of the top of the sack green lettuce. I thought my sal salivary glands would split with aching for that leafy greenness. I'm gonna stop for a moment. This again, very elemental, very prosaic, most ordinary streetcar, most ordinary trolley tracks, most ordinary citizens. What is happening in the most ordinary everyday uh, commuting of these people in the city of Warsaw? They are traveling through a ghetto of indescribable horror. And what she focuses on is not uh, a roast chicken or luscious grapes or something exotic, a head of lettuce that her gland would split for the ache of it. And girls wearing hats. They were all the sort of plain people of the working class with slovenly speech, she's an elitist, who ride tram cars, but they were considered better than we because no one regarded us as Poles anymore. And we, my father, my mother, we had so many pretty jugs on the piano and shining little tables, replicas of Greek vases, and one an actual archaeological find that my father had dug up on a school vacation in his teens on a trip to Crete. It was all pieced together in the missing parts, which broke up the design of a warrior with a javelin filled in with reddish clay. And on the walls, up and down the corridors and along the stairs, we had wonderful ink drawings, the black so black and miraculous, how it measured out a hand and then a shadow of a hand. And with all this, especially our Polish, the way my parents enunciated Polish in soft, calm voices with the most precise articulation so that every syllable struck its target. The people in the tram car were regarded as Poles. Well, they were. I don't take that away from them, though they took it away from us, and we were not. So this bitterness is not just about what happens in the concentration camp that she hasn't yet reached. This is her class consciousness, the same class consciousness that puts the barbed wire around the posh hotel in Miami, where she's looking to exclude people because her family had pretty jugs and they don't. I think this is very savvy on Ozick's part to say this is not a woman without blemish. She does not deserve to be traumatized the way that she is, but she is horrified that her cultured citizenship is lost to her and that these ragtag women 
are allowed to be treated as poles. They who couldn't read one line of Truem, never mind Virgil, and my father who nearly who knew nearly the whole first half of the Aeneid by heart. And in this place, now I am like the woman who held the lettuce in the tram car, that is, in Miami. I said all this in my store, to, store talking to the deaf, how I became like the woman with the lettuce. So I say this is to Ozick's credit because you can understand the bitterness of Rosa now some years from her tragedy, not having recovered it, but some distance, uh, the suggestion of Persky, you have to work at being a regular person. It sounds like she might be setting out on that enterprise. There's a part of her that resents that she's being treated this way because she's a pole, a literate, well-spoken pole who has precious possessions in her museum-like home. In that way, we can see her shop as a kind of parody of that home. Uh, and when we talk about one thing being double, one thing being more than one meaning, is a shop of collectibles an antique shop or is it a junk shop? A uh, very thin line between, oh, she's a hoarder of junk, she's a collector of junk, oh, she's a collector of fine art, of artifacts. And most striking is that this Holocaust, this pre-concentration camp ghetto is happening alongside the uh, local tram service going from the east side to the west side. It's what Hannah Arendt brilliantly described with the phrase, the banality of evil, that when she did a probing sociological study of not the architects of the final solution, but the bureaucrats and everyday people along the way who signed off on the clearances for the railroad, who signed off on sending the gas to the concentration camps, she found that they were just that, bureaucrats, people who were just doing their job, and that the thing about their evil was that it was not dramatic, it was not cinematic, it was not striking, it was banal, it was just every day, like somebody checking out library books. And if you ever read her essays on that, it takes your breath away about the association side by side of the ordinary with the horrific. That's one of the remarkable things about that insight that she shares with her dead daughter. I'll stop again, Michael. Okay, folks, so feel free to uh, give us some more comments and uh, we'll uh, talk about them in the next 10 or so minutes. So while we're waiting, Michael, there are other things I can say. I just want you to interrupt me if a hand goes up while I'm speaking, okay? Will do. So I have said to this group before, I don't expect you to remember, but if you keep inviting me back, I'm going to repeat myself, that I can imagine teaching a very good survey of literature looking at three themes only, three themes and images. One is the idea of ghosts not just a ghost in the sense of a spirit returning to the world of living people, but a ghost in the broadest sense that if you take a painting down from the wall of a room that uh, the painting has been up for decades, you're going to see the original color of the rectangle behind the painting that wasn't bleached out by the light of the room or the sun. And that square or rectangle is going to be a ghost of the picture that was there, by which I mean to say it is going to remind you of the presence of an absence, which is my working definition of a ghost. If my aunt dies and I never think of her, she's dead. If my aunt doesn't die, she's here. But if she dies and I am haunted either by memories of her, dreams of her, or what I think is her presence, she's come back for me to know that she's gone. She's the presence of an absence, like that rectangle on the wall. Literature is filled with trying to enact the presence of an absence. 
uh, like the ghost of Magda here. Another one of my three central themes or images is the idea of a secret, that it's a rare novel, even if it's not a mystery novel or a detective novel, that doesn't have characters sharing or keeping secrets. There's a fundamental fact that even a plot that's a comic plot, even a, a plot that doesn't have a mystery that's not particularly suspenseful, we read because one secret we're interested in finding out is how does it turn out? But that's kind of trivial. Most every novel I've ever read has some important information that some characters have and others do not. Sometimes a character has it and we don't have it. Sometimes the author or narrator has it and nobody else has it. Uh, one of the great secrets in this book is that Magda exists in the concentration camp. It begins with that notion uh, early on. It, the first name invoked, the first word of the first story is Stella. The first word of the second story is Rosa, Rosa Lublin. Um, Magda, Magna being hidden is one of the great secrets of the novel. And then the third, ghosts and secrets are doubles. And I mean double both in the sense of a character who seems to be a reflection, a repetition or reversal of another character, but also double in the sense that something can have a double value like barbed wire or explosives and fireworks. So she says on page 19 to Persky that 39 years ago, I was somebody else. She says repeatedly, my Warsaw is not your Warsaw. So not only is there a double Warsaw, the Warsaw of people buying lettuce and the Warsaw of people uh, enclosed in the ghetto, there's also the Warsaw of his generation and the Warsaw of her generation. Um, this, her specialty when she had her shop was antique mirrors. And of course, a mirror is a perfect representation of doubleness. Uh, you're reflected in it. In most literature, a mirror has one of two often conflicting values symbolically. On the one hand, it is often used to represent vanity. It is self-reflection in a trivial or superficial sense. It's not doing an inventory. Uh, mirrors are connected with vanity. But mirrors also do use for self-reflection. Many memoirs and autobiographies play on the notion of mirrors of someone taking a look at themselves. Rose's specialty was antique mirrors. One of the things she doesn't have the habit of when we see her in Miami, or which she's lost in Miami, is to be self-reflective. Uh, she reminisces about the past, and she says that that's exhausting. But what Persky is inviting her to do is to actually take a look at herself. He comes in as real therapy. Another, another, uh, and there are many mirrors in the lobby of her hotel. Another uh, issue or theme of doubleness, and then I'll stop there, is when she writes to Stella mostly in English and writes to Magda mostly in literary Polish, claiming a close affinity with the daughter and putting the distance of language, English, between her and her niece. Cynthia Ozick said, and I'm reading a quote now, that since the coming forth from Egypt five millennia ago, mine is the first generation to think and speak and write wholly in English. And she confessed that she felt the weight of whether that fact was a betrayal of her heritage, whether her not publishing in Yiddish or Hebrew or Polish or some language not English some language associated uh, with the Holocaust or the diaspora was a betrayal. And she recognized that her generation, um, uh, her generation is more or less the generation of uh, Rosa. Uh, she was born in 1928. Rosa, I think, is born about 19, in the 1920s. Uh, that that's their lot. They have gotten far enough away from the 19th century that their way of telling the truth is to tell it in English. Okay, I'll stop there, Michael. 
So actually, we've got a comment on your 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 three main themes you were talking about a little while ago. And Francie is asking the question, is memory slash flashback crucial to activating all three of those stylistic techniques? So um, that's a very broad question. And uh, I, I think the wisest answer is it can be sometimes. I, I'm not suggesting that the three um, images or motifs are associated necessarily with each other. Even the act of memory is itself a doubleness, right? I am here remembering me then. Um, you want to say that even the narration of a novel, without getting into complicated literary theory, the whole idea uh, some years ago of criticism was that when someone writes on a page, uh, she stood on the bus, we recognize that the word bus is not a bus. It's a representation of a bus. Um, uh, it is a reminder that this thing, the U.S., is not the bus. And certain critics make a point about when you read literature, you're reminded of the gap between the representation of the thing and the thing itself. And a whole uh, sophisticated criticism of the 70s came out uh, about that idea that literature is always calling attention to its own deficiencies. Some of you know uh, the great, great Rene Magritte's painting of a giant, very realistic pipe that has in script below it in French, he was Belgian, Ceci n'a pas une pipe a large script caption saying, this is not a pipe. It is the best pipe you could imagine. It's a better pipe than I could ever draw. But his point is, the fact that this looks like a pipe should remind you that it can't begin to capture the reality of a pipe. This beautiful, realistic, convincing, credible pipe is always going to fall short of the pipe itself. So in that sense, both ghostliness and doubleness is part of literature. And one way we could apply it to this novel, and then I'll make this uh, my last comment at eight o'clock, is that however moving and poignant, however traumatizing to read or imagine the scene of this innocent child being thrown against an electric fence, it doesn't come close to what the Germans would say, das Ding an sich the thing itself. The best approximation of horror in the best writer's hand is always going to fall woefully short of actually having lived it, which of course it must. We can't pretend that we can get from the experience of a novel anything approaching that trauma. So I leave you with that and the challenge of writing about the unreality of reality. This happened even though it's hard to convince ourselves that the Holocaust happened. And please, you know, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean denying it. I mean, just getting our minds around how could such a thing be? Thank you again for your attendance and your attending. Thank you, Michael, for everything. And I will see you either at a distance or in person a week from tonight. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, another great session. I learned a lot. And uh, I've sent the email out, folks, so feel free to let me know, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Stay well, everyone. Thank you, Michael.